that no earthly storm can move. And as you have faith, so shall your powers be. And know that till the end, I'm all. called a portrait of pioneering and in the Baha'i faith when when we do you know leave our country and go to another country to help the Baha'is there it's called pioneering and so that's where the title comes from and a portrait of course she's an artiste she's an artist that's, that's a wonderful, the title. wonderful title in 1982 New Zealand artist Robin White her husband, Mike Furukowski, and their eight-year-old son, Michael, moved to Kiribati, previously known as the Gilbert Islands. Two more of their children, Conrad and Florence, were born there. Ken, that's a really lovely video that you made on Robin White in Kiribati. Thank you. A lot of people have just, they asked us to replay it when we played it on TV here. Mm -hmm. Would you like to tell us, what was it that inspired you to make this video on this lady from New Zealand who's gone such a long way away to Kiribati? Well, I first heard Robin White um, on national radio in New Zealand, an interview, because occasionally she makes trips back from Kiribati to New Zealand, her home, and visits some of her children who are going to school there, etc. And she was talking about the beauty of Kiribati, and she was talking about uh, uh, some of her artwork there and how it changed, and I got to thinking, why is this woman speak, I mean, why is she being interviewed on radio when she's talking about all these visual things? So we thought, oh, we should, we should get her on television. One way pioneering has affected Robin's art has been a change in media from an emphasis on painting to working mostly with woodcut prints. Through her father, Robin is of New Zealand Maori ancestry. In Maori society, a prominent place is held by the whakairo, the master carvers. This uh, beautiful work that they produced out of wood. <laughs> and I just felt at home with it. It was not a problem. And uh, I loved that sense of cutting into the wood and creating images. <laughs> So I tried to get uh, Television New Zealand interested and TV3 in New Zealand. No, they weren't interested for some reason. They want more sensational type stuff, you know, more titillation or whatever. But for whatever reason, they, they turned me down. So I thought it's too good of a story to pass by and that um, I'll put my own money into it and make the video myself. Um, so that's basically what I did. <laughs> Kiribati straddles both the equator and the international dateline. These Micronesian people have lived for hundreds of years on these small islands, covering two million square miles of Pacific Ocean. The capital is located on the atoll of Tarawa. It is also the home of our pioneer family. Although South Tarawa is very urban, it still tends to function as a village, far more so obviously on an outer island, but we are still living in what feels like a village. And I, I really have this feeling a village is a very healthy unit to live in. It, it's, a, it, it's a manageable human scale. It seems to fulfill the needs of human beings at every level, material, intellectual, social, cultural. I mean, a city is a, a wonderful buzz. It's exciting, and I love going back into the big city. And it has much to offer. But there are some things a city doesn't necessarily offer. On that human level of wanting social, warm, <laughs> loving contact with people, which is very nourishing to your soul, to your, to your spirit. 
and it's what keeps you going, what keeps me going. <laughs> Feel sorry for people in big cities sometimes. <laughs> How long ago did you do that? I did it about uh, four years ago. Uh -huh. So things I haven't changed there. She still lives in Kiribati and uh, she just has her younger child there. Um, and we went there for 10 days of videotaping, um, which was a very memorable time because the Gilbertese people, the e Kiribati, as they're called, people are wonderful. Yeah. And um, so it was a sheer delight all the way through. Yeah. And what happens almost spiritually or organically when something goes so smoothly in the shoot, you know the final product is going to be wonderful too. Yeah. So it's probably um, one of my most favorite projects that I've ever made. So I, I took it on myself, so therefore I produced it, I directed it, I came back to New Zealand and did the editing, and now pretty much I'm did it, doing the distribution because yeah. but places like the Cook Islands will, will use it for broadcasting, and it's shown you know, in many cable televisions in North America and uh, cable television stations. So it's getting a lot of viewing, and just recently when I was over in Achu, uh, their little broadcasting thing, they had three nights a week for four hours, they put it on TV, and the people around the island loved it, too. Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. It was good to see. Baha'is believe that God sent many teachers at different times to bring humankind added knowledge as we matured. The thing to do then is to start introducing new Baha'is to the teachings of Baha'u'llah. We have a, a Baha'i administrative system and how that functions and what their role is in that. Because everybody's involved, because in the Baha'i faith, there is no clergy. Baha'u'llah is saying to humanity, you've grown up. I think the people in the islands really like to see some of the things that are happening in some of the other islands ah, of the Pacific. Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the comments that I heard a lot here was about Robin herself, and she speaks the local language, and dancing, you had a lovely <laughs> shots of her in that, in that video, dancing yeah. the local dancers yeah. with beautiful costume. be a great thrill for her. You would have enjoyed that. Yeah, I did. And there's something special about Robin herself. Um, she has, uh, obviously, her philosophy and her teaching is Baha'i. Yeah. But um, she doesn't preach her teaching. She also lives her teaching. She talks about equality of men and women and the oneness of mankind and all these principles that are basically Baha'i. And then you see her with the women, and you see her working with the women, and you see her with the diversity of people, and learning the language, you know, fitting into, into the culture, not trying to be the Papa or the Palangi or whatever. You know, she fits in with the people. She sits on the floor, you know, where us Europeans, we got to sit on our chairs or whatever. And so that's what makes it great, that she's She's the star, she's yes. the shining light. She's and I don't mean movie star, yeah. I mean spiritual, yeah. you know, brilliant star. It's, it's a real source of uh, joy and inspiration you know, to be involved in that area. It makes you feel good inside, you know, to see, <coughs> to see people change. I've seen people change dramatically from women who uh, never said anything on a money of it because according to a Kiribati custom, women don't 
speak in the, in the meeting house, you know, the money up. Women are not involved in the decision-making processes of the community at that official level, according to custom here. So for Baha'i women to, to get involved, it takes enormous confidence and courage. The reason why Baha'is are doing it is because it is one of the basic principles of the Baha'i faith, the equality of men and women. You could say it's a tenet of faith. And there's a very uh, clear illustration of this principle from Abdul Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah, where he says, think of humanity as a bird. And a bird has two wings. Imagine that one wing is men and the other wing is women. Now, for that bird to fly, both wings have got to be operating in unison and they have to both be strong. If one is strong and the other is weak, the bird's going to go around in circles. It's not going to get to where it wants to go. It'll never get there. That's a very clear illustration. Anyone can understand that when you look at it that way. It doesn't mean that we are the same, that, that we necessarily have to do the same things. That we, we may have a separation of function. For example, biologically, we're different. Women do have babies and breastfeed babies. Men can't do that. No one expects it to be any different. That's, that's the way it is. But the equality, as I understand it, the equality that we're talking about in the Baha'i writings is an equality of opportunity. It seems like when, when you did that video, she had more than one of her children living with her yeah. in Kiribati. It must have been very difficult for her after her children had to go to New Zealand. Yeah, that was the probably, she says herself, is the biggest sacrifice she made. Yeah. Is that she had to send her children away to New Zealand to get further education, that yeah. sort of thing. She was asked by the Baha'is of New Zealand to go there as pioneers. We don't have missionaries right. in the Baha'i faith. We're not missionaries. So we go to a country and we have get our job and we're not supported by sort of any mother church, if you will. Right. So Baha'is then just go. We're still... Uh, Baha'is um, along with the other Baha'is doing the Baha'i work and nobody's an authority, nobody is higher than somebody else and that sort of thing. Yeah. So that was, she says, is her only sacrifice and uh, everything else she plans to live there yeah. until they bury her bones. As right, she says. right. <laughs> It's natural that they have acquired the language out of, from their environment, but they've also acquired English. In terms of speaking language, English was definitely a second language. Neither of them spoke English in any fluent form until we took them to New Zealand. Yeah. And in Conrad's case, it was when he was nearly four years old. I, I'm really grateful <laughs> that one of the benefits of pioneering has been having children who are, who are bilingual. They seem to us, to, anyway, to be perfectly at home in, in two no. cultures, uh, because here they are ikiribas, and all of their friends are ikiribas. It's wonderful that she's able to do her art in Kiribati. Yeah. And she's got a lot of expression from Kiribati in her art for yes. the years she's been there. Well, that was yeah. something that really happened big because you'll notice in the beginning of the film it talked about her, her fame in the art world right. with uh, New Zealand work. She's a well-known artist. Yeah. 
and then going to Kiribati, that all stopped. Her subjects changed. You know, she started painting the Kiribati people. But also, her media of, of art, um, she started working with woodcuts and, and the knife, you know, and making prints. Yeah. Because the canvas and the oils and what she worked with before wasn't that available there. Yeah. And so, she became a new person again, a new artist. Yeah, yeah. Each of the images are of a vertical arrangement rather than a horizontal. I mean, it's much easier to arrange a sort of a narrative kind of image on a horizontal level. I've sort of crowded everything into this vertical arrangement and in a sense that, to me, hopefully conveys something of the kind of the crowded nature of life in Kiribati, where you are thrust, constantly thrust up against human issues. You can't just go off and be a hermit somewhere and, and disassociate yourself from what other people are, are thinking and doing. You're constantly thrust up against what is happening around you at the human level. Robin's earlier New Zealand paintings hang in art galleries and places of prominence in many parts of the country. The bold shapes, colors and subjects had a strong effect on a generation of New Zealanders, often depicting landscapes and faces of friends and family. These are the, ones, the images that perhaps many New Zealanders still remember me by, you know, the, the hills, the combination of sky, hill, and sea. And people who are important to me at that time. With this kind of backdrop, you know, the painting of my mother, Florence and Harbour Cone, which is that's a well-known painting. How long did it take you to do the filming for that video? It's interesting because it's like a 45-minute video. Yeah. And we videotaped for, uh, 10 days yeah. and all over the island on trucks and off trucks and <laughs> filming the, at the seashore and in yeah. her house and got up in the morning as they brushed their teeth and got ready for school. <laughs> yeah, all yeah. This. So we lived with them yeah. and we had the camera right there and got a lot of the magic moments, yeah. you know, when she's dancing with her daughter and the red radio's playing. Um, so it was a new experience. It wasn't like a professional crew, okay, it's eight to five and we okay, gotta study at eight yeah. o'clock, get up and. No, it filmed to midnight if we had to, or we'd get up at six in the morning yeah. with the pigs and the chickens and everybody. <laughs> <laughs> All those years ago when you were working in Hollywood, did you ever think that one day you'd be filming yeah. in this little island? Never. Yeah. And it's just wonderful being in the Pacific because Hollywood and I left that and went to New Zealand. That was a big change and a great change for us because we love New Zealand. Right. But then to have the opportunity to be close to the Pacific Island nations yeah. is something I dreamed of as a youth. Oh. When I was home in Buffalo, New York, where I used to live, and I'd look at these National Geographics and this, these beautiful sandy beaches and I would be in snowdrifts outside below zero freezing <laughs> and yeah. here I am. <laughs> right, right. That's so lovely for us in the Pacific that you've chosen to come down this end yeah. of the world. finished with university and teacher training college, I decided to look for work in television. And I worked in children's television in Dunedin for seven years. Worked on some other programs as well, some quizzes, um, a home handyman show for six months. And it was in 1982, or at the end of 81, that we got the invitation to consider going pioneering. And I was quite Let's say I wasn't displeased to consider abandoning my career. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't have much going for my, you know, my career didn't have much going for it in television. As foreigners, 
Life here for the family has presented its challenges, especially for Mike. Because of limited employment opportunities, he has not had steady work. Teaching high school had provided occasional temporary employment. I did what I could to, to earn a supplementary income, including one of the most disgusting jobs I've ever had in my life, and I've had lots and lots of jobs, but exporting eel guts to Hawaii was <laughs> one of the worst. It was quite lucrative. And another interesting point is Mike, um, because it's not mentioned in the video, but after many years of struggling there, because it was more of a sacrifice for him, because he couldn't get work, he couldn't get paid work, so he got work wherever he could. And he Hanging out here in kitty bands. So he reached a point where he was fed up, he thought. That was it. He's going back to New Zealand, and of course, Robin understood. She's a loving, caring person. She felt sorry for Mike and said, okay, that means we'll all go back, if Mike's got to go back. It would break her heart, but she'd do it because she wants to make Mike happy. Yeah. So he went back to New Zealand for a few months. Yeah. <laughs> and he took a course in English second language because he thought, oh, I could get a job doing that because he was an English teacher in the past. And he started to look for a home, and he rented a car, and he met with the Baha'is and this and that. And at one point, Robin gets a call from him in, in Kiribati, and it's Mike. He says, I'm coming home. I can't stand New Zealand. I've got oh. culture shock. <laughs> and he's back there. Yeah. And that's where he'll stay, too. Right. So he, he had to find out that New Zealand wasn't the great place yeah. and that he loved it. And now he's got a good job there. So. That's wonderful. I'm not a missionary. I'm an ordinary Baha'i doing here what I do in Dunedin. I'm not going to go around telling people what to do and you know, how to run the Baha'i community. It's a, it's a learning experience that we're all sharing together, finding out by you know, deepening our understanding of the writings and applying the, the principles to the Baha'i community. The Baha'i faith recognizes the importance of the maintenance of traditional cultures. At the same time, it offers new spiritual principles to protect humanity from materialism, disunity, substance abuse, and other excesses of the modern age. This country was never swamped with Western influence. It's creeping in gradually as it is all around the world. Video, the effect of videos and so on. This place was very much isolated by its geographical location and the fact that the British administration kept it sort of as a, almost an isolationist policy, didn't develop routes of communication to the country. And so this country has retained its cultural identity very, very strongly. What you need to look for is, you know, when they're moving the hips, the idea is to keep the rest of the body really s still. So your, your shoulders shouldn't be going up and down, and your arms should be very still. It's very difficult to do. <laughs> it takes enormous discipline to do. And your, every mo the movement should be crisp. Like your eyes, everything, every part of your body has a position to be in. And your eyes, the movement of your head from one side to another, the, the direction in which you're looking is all prescribed. You know? <laughs> see it as, the, as a great resource. 
Ken, that was just so good. Every time I see that video, I just feel so good about Robin. I really enjoy it. Yeah, good. You, you must have been thrilled to see it again, too. Yeah, I always am. I never get sick of it. No. A lot of projects I work on, I get sick yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah. But I'm very proud of it. Yeah. It, because I think one of the outstanding things of the video was the variety of uh, the music. Yeah. Uh, interesting, a lot of the dance that was done with costume. Um, a village, especially, put on that dance for the camera. Oh, it wasn't yeah. a special occasion, right. other than they wanted us to be able to get yeah. it on videotape. Yeah. So they meant to great length to, to put all the costumes on and yeah. do the dance. And they all look so happy, you know. Well, they, they were. They look like it's just a wonderful time for them. Yeah. 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 It so it was, it was a thrill to me. Yeah. It really was. <laughs> Well, thank you, Ken, very much. It's just a, such a privilege for us to have you here with us. Thank you right. so much for sharing it's a with pleasure us. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. Kia ora. Thank you. Kia ora.